worthy is the lamb. You know, we don't have to wait until we get to heaven to do that. We should be doing that right here each and every day. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your copy of God's word to Malachi chapter 3, starting with verse 6. Malachi chapter 3, starting with verse 6. As we continue our Healthy Church series and as we deal with Christ-centered worship and flesh that out through the manners of our worship, uh, we've dealt with many different topics of how we worship God. And so one of the ways, and actually it's the last way that we'll be dealing with the manners of our worship, is through our giving, through generous giving. Uh, and I want you to understand that as we talk about giving, it's not necessarily just with money. As we give to the Lord, we give our time, our talent, and our resources. All of those things. So for some of you, you'll be given your time as we come out here on Saturday to, to deal with this. Some of you, you'll be giving of your talent. There are some of you who signed up and you're going to be maybe baking cakes or baking brownies or making cookies or whatever it is. Or, or maybe you're going to give of your resources and you're going to go out and buy little Debbie cakes and that'll be the dessert. And that's great too. I love a little Debbie cake. Uh, but it, it's a... It, we see that we give through many different ways as we are following Jesus. And so I don't want you to take this as though it's a focus on your money, but God focuses on our money. And there's a reason why he does. Because money is one of the ways that we get tripped up in the Christian life. Anybody gotten tripped up over money in your Christian walk? Not many of you are honest about it, evidently, but I, I would have believed that there's many of us who have gotten tripped up over our money. Uh, many times we look at giving and we say, oh, wow, well, that, that pastor, he, I've been here almost two years. I mean, we're, we're getting close now to, to two years, and I have not preached a message once on giving. The reason why I haven't is because I don't need to preach to the choir. This church gives. I praise the Lord for your giving. You're generous. You give gladly. You give abundantly. Many of you give sacrificially. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to deal with it because the Scripture deals with it. And we need to be reminded occasionally of what God says about our giving because, listen, uh, life hits. We lose a job. We get laid off. I mean, I'm thinking right now about those in Canton who uh, I don't even know how many hundreds and hundreds of people have lost their jobs through, through this plant shutdown. And many of them are wondering, where am I going to work? How am I going to support my family? And, and the last thing that they're probably thinking about in their minds is what they're going to give to the church. Because that's, that's what we do. We, we get hit hard and things are not working out well, and many times we, we kind of draw inward. Now, it makes sense. We've got to pay bills. You know, we've got to feed our children. We, we've got to do all those things. But I want to tell you that if we are truly worshiping God through our giving, we will find a way to give. I'll give you a, one particular short instance with my mother. My mother uh, used to be threatened by my father. Uh, my father did not want anything to do with God, didn't want anything to do with the church. And he would threaten her, you better not give any of our money to that church. You're going, I know they're asking for your money. You better not give a dime of it. Well, my father would give my mother basically an allowance to go out and get groceries. It was barely enough to get anything at the grocery store. And we had food stamps and other things. And if it weren't for that and weren't for my grandparents, we would have probably starved to death. My mother would take that little bit of allowance. And without telling my father would give it to the church and would tell me, because I was the oldest and the others wouldn't understand it anyway, don't you say a word. We're going to be obedient. In those moments, listen, I ate mayonnaise sandwiches growing up and it's not because I liked them. It's because we couldn't afford the meat to put on a sandwich. But I tell you what, my mother made sure that she gave. Why? Was it because of a law, a command? No, it was because of her love for Christ. 
And she took him at his word that he would provide. And he always did, mind you. I'm standing here today because God provided. As we look at giving through the scriptures, uh, I want to draw our attention to something that maybe you've heard of before. You've heard some arguments maybe about the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Those two things are totally different. Jesus dealt with several issues of the law where people followed the letter of the law, but they missed the spirit of the law. So in the Old Testament, we get uh, this teaching of the tithe. Abraham gave the first tithe to uh, Melchizedek. It says he brought him a tenth in that moment. That's what tithe means in the original language. It means a tenth. And then we see throughout Scripture that tenth being mentioned. Uh, It's even mentioned in the New Testament, and we'll get into that in just a little bit, uh, but maybe not quite in the same way. So many people looked at the command and took it by the letter of the law. Let me give you a couple of other instances outside of giving where this happens. Matthew 5, 21 through 22. By the way, you should have an insert in your bulletin with some fill in the blanks there if you want to get that out. You can fill that in as I'm preaching. This will become a little study guide for you. Each and every week we try to do this. Matthew 5, 21 through 22. 22. It says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So what was Jesus doing? He was saying, you know, the letter of the law, the way you took it was you shall not murder, meaning taking a life, killing somebody, taking the lifeblood from them. So they were going, okay, yeah, we should not do that. He says, but I say, what is he doing now? He's moving into the spirit of the law. He moves from the letter into the spirit. He says, if you have hatred towards your brother, it's as if you've already killed them. Where does murder begin? Begins in the heart. Let's be honest. There's nobody that goes out and commits murder intentionally where it didn't begin on the inside. There was anger, hatred, lust, envy, whatever it may be. There's something going on in the heart that's amiss. And it fleshes itself out through the act of murder. So it's moving from the, Jesus moves them from the letter of law to the spirit of law. Let's give one more. Matthew 5, 27 through 28 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Why would Jesus say that? Because adultery in its physical form begins where? In the heart and in the mind. There's never been an adultery that didn't start on the inside where you thought about it, you desired it, you, you went, wow, look at that right there. I'd like to see more of it, whatever it happens to be. And so Jesus is once again taking them from the letter of the law that they understood to the spirit of the law, uh, getting them where it hurts in a sense and trying to clear out that unrighteousness that's on the inside of them. Now notice that Jesus in these cases, he did not do away with the law. He didn't say, uh, say, you've got it wrong. No, it's okay to murder. He's not saying that. But he clarifies the law. And each time, it expanded the scope of the law. As a matter of fact, if you read Matthew chapter 5, you'll see several other instances. It's one of those chapters where it's over and over again. You have heard it said, I say this. And he clears up things and it always expands the meaning. Now there have been many discussions about whether tithing is still commanded in our day. Now I believe that the command to give still applies. But here's one thing I want you to be clear on. In the Old Testament... It began with a tenth, but it never ended there. 
As a matter of fact, most people that have studied it over and over again, they believe with all of the times where they were to give, no matter what it was, it would end up being anywhere from 20 to 30% of all that they took in. And you go, what? 20 to 30%? I, I sure hope you ain't asking me to do that. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. Why, why would that be the case? Well, it was automatic a tenth. That was the base. And it builds up from there. Well, every so many years, on the seventh year, it would say you would forgive others of their debts to you. That's a gift to the Lord, the way he looks at it. There were free will offerings that were given. That's given to the Lord or for the Lord's sake. Now it's going to help others, but it's given for the Lord's sake. So tenth was a foundation, and then it built up from there based on their sacrificial giving. So today we're going to look at Malachi chapter 3. It's probably the most preached on when it's de dealing with uh, giving. And I felt like it was probably where we needed to go today. So I'm going to read that. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. He's saying right now, because I'm the same, because I'm faithful, because I've said something to you, you haven't been destroyed. You go, well, what's that all about? Well, evidently they haven't been doing something that God wanted them to do. Something is wrong because God said he could have destroyed them over it. So this is serious. We just need to understand that before we move forward with this text. Something is seriously wrong. But God says, I, look, I have a plan. I'm leading you someplace. And because I said it, it's going to be done. But it's not that I don't have the right to destroy you off the face of the planet if I chose to. Verse 7. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Let's think through it. How many times have we seen through the Old Testament? God's people. Chosen people. God leads them through one trial and then they start mumbling and grumbling. He leads them through another trial. They start turning to other idols. He moves them through another trial and they do exactly what God told them not to do. Over and over and over again. We need to understand this. That God's saying, from the days of your fathers, from your ancestors, from the very beginning, is basically what this is pointing to. You have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. How would you love for this community to look at Oak Forest Baptist Church and say, all the nations will call you blessed because you are a church of the light. How would you like that? How would you like for this community to look at us and go, wow, they're blessed by God. Something's different about them. I said, we, I, we don't understand it. We can't explain it. But something's different about this place. Man, it's so good. I think we might want to be a part of it. I think all of us would love for that to be the case. But he's saying that that's the way it can be. Not the way it was. Because they're not doing what God had commanded them to do. So let's go through our outline today. We're first going to look at the letter of the law. If we start to break this down according to the letter of the law. First, we need to see that tithing was commanded by God. Over and over and over again, it was commanded. God said, you shall do this. You will do this. He even set up a system whereby this was done. 
As a matter of fact, we know that even the parents of Jesus gave their tithe, gave their tenth, and probably even above that, even though they were very poor. So it was commanded by God, and because it was commanded, the act of tithing would be obedience to God, right? If God commands something, then when we do it, that means we're being obedient. How many times in our lives are we disobedient to what God has commanded in our lives? Many people say, well, you know, Jesus didn't speak about this or, what, or this. It this, doesn't matter what he spoke about or what he didn't speak about. What does the Bible say and are we doing it? That's really where it comes down to. Does the Bible say that we should give? Absolutely. Are we giving? That's the question. Um, it is estimated the last time it was checked uh, that of regular attenders in churches nationwide, the average giving is 3%. 3%. So if a baseline would have been 10%, if that's what they were looking at, uh, then we fall well below that baseline. Can there be sacrificial giving in that? Yeah, from individuals, there are sacri there's sacrificial giving. But all total, they're saying that 3% of those who are regular attenders in a church give. So that means that if we believe that God told us that we should give and we're only given 3%, we could be disobedient, right? I, mean, we, I think we're pretty safe to say that we could be disobedient by not giving. So the act of tithing was obedience to God. And that means if act of tithing was obedience to God, then failing to tithe is sinful. So verse 8, will man rob God? What is he saying in this moment? He said, you withholding your giving is robbing me. Now, is, is God the one who's technically getting the money that you put in the offering plate here? If you want to look at it technically, no, he's not the one that's getting. Are we technically giving to God? Yes. It's kind of weird, ain't it? It's not like the money is going from Rudy's hands as treasurer in the counters at the end of the service. It's not going from their hand and they're going to hand it up to Jesus and say, here you go, Lord, you know, give us back what, what you want us to have sort of thing. But every time we give, we're giving it to the Lord for His purposes here on earth. And so the disobedience that these people were in is that they were robbing God in their tithes and contributions. They were not giving what they should have been giving. And so failing to tithe was sinful, and sinfulness brings consequences. We see that in verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now listen, does it mean when he says the whole nation of you is robbing me, does that mean that every single person is not giving? No. Could there be many people who are giving above and beyond? Yes. But what he's saying, when you start putting it together, the whole nation is given far less than what it should. That reveals the numbers that we just gave, or I just gave you. If the regular attenders of churches is only given 3%, then it, we could say that the whole church is giving less than what they should give, even though there are individuals that are giving and giving well. So sinfulness brings consequences. But obedience brings blessings. We see this in verse number 10. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. So uh, it, it blesses others. That's the one thing we need to understand. So obedience brings blessing to others as you're following along in your outline. Well, how does that work? Well, you're bringing food. We need to understand in their culture, it's an agrarian society. Uh, most of us, we got a few that have gardens in here, but most of us, we're not living off the land these days. But in these days, it was an agrarian economy. And so what you would do is you would take your harvest and give 10% out of the harvest. Where did that stuff go? It went to the temple so that the people of God could be fed. 
the widows, the orphans, those who were sick and infirmed, those who could not provide for themselves. And so that's a blessing to others. So if we give as a church and we give sacrificially to God's work here in this church, then more and more people are being blessed through that work. We're about to do this meal where the community is not paying anything for that. Why? Because you gave. So your giving is blessing others. We're about to commission 93 missionaries to the field, full-time, fully taken care of as they hit the ground running. Why? Because churches like ours give. And so others are being blessed through giving. But it doesn't stop with a blessing to others. It also goes to a blessing for ourselves. Listen to the second half of verse 10 and moving forward. It says, And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So number one, he's saying, Hey, put me to the test. They're saying, Well, I just don't know about this whole thing. I, you know, I'm not... I'm not sure. I mean, I really need to pay bills. Yeah, I need to do this. I need to do that. And God says, why don't you put me to the test? Why don't you just give and trust me and see what I do? Now, does it mean that your bank account's going to fill up? No. Does it mean you're going to get a random check in the mail? And you're going to go, wow, I had a rich uncle that passed away that I didn't know about. No, it's, it's, it's not that kind of thing. But God does say that you will be blessed. He will pour down a blessing for you until there is no more need. What a promise that is. Then he says in verse 11, like I said, we're in an agrarian economy. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. What is he talking about there? Maybe it's the locusts who come through occasionally. They kind of cycle around. And when the locusts come, they go in and they destroy total crops. Everything, eat everything off of the vine, every leaf, every bloom, every fruit, whatever is there. It would come through and absolutely destroy it. He says, I will rebuke, uh, rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and the vine in your field will bear fruit. That's the God we serve. He says, but you got to put me to the test. You got to start doing it first. And don't do it reluctantly. We'll get into this in just a few moments. We shouldn't give going, man, oh, can't believe I'm doing this, you know, kind of thing. We should give with a cheerful heart. So let's move from the letter of the law. We've experienced that now. We've seen that. Let's move into the spirit of the law. And I'm going to go through uh, multiple other texts, which you should see on the screen here. Uh, most of them should be in your bulletin outline as well. We'll look at the spirit of the law. The first point I want to give to you as we look beyond the letter of the law and look into the spirit of the law is that God owns it all. You and I own nothing. You say, well, I got a house over here. I got a car. I got this. I got that. Yeah, you don't own anything. As a matter of fact, most of us don't own it anyway. The bank owns it. If you want to look in a worldly way. But ultimately, God owns everything. 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I think the expansion at the end of that verse where he says the earth is the Lord's. People could mistake that and go, oh, the planet itself, the earth is the Lord's. He says, but and the fullness thereof, meaning everything on it. So not only the earth, yeah, he created that, but everything that's on the earth is also his. Psalm 50, 10 through 12 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not even tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. What does he say? I'm not looking to you for anything. 
I don't need you. God doesn't need us. We need to understand that. And I know that seems a little harsh. God doesn't need us. There is absolutely nothing that I can give God to repay him for what he's done for me through his son, Jesus Christ. There's nothing I can do. No matter how hard I try, I can't do that. But I can honor him. I can praise him. I can worship him in all of the ways that he has called me to do it. God is making sure that we understand that he doesn't need us, that he owns it. Why would he ask us for anything? He, he doesn't need anything from us. But what he's asking for us is us to truly love him. That's what he's asking for. And understand that God is in charge of it all. When we begin to understand that God owns it all, then we also begin to understand that we're nothing but stewards. Which means we just got to take care of those things that God has allowed us to have. And there's many times throughout Scripture where he talks about uh, being a good steward of his creation. Being a good steward of whatever he blesses us with. So first, we understand that God owns it all. Next, God allows us to be stewards of his possessions. Genesis 1.28 says, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What is he saying to Adam in this moment? Adam and Eve, both. He's saying, take a look around. You see everything around you? I made it. I gave it so that you would take care of it. From the very beginning, he told Adam that his job was to take care of the garden. He even allows him to name all of the animals. It's almost like they marched in front of him one by one. And he went, yeah, I, I think uh, I'll call that one a hippopotamus or you know, whatever it was. Uh, God gave him that, though. We need to understand that everything that Adam named, the fruitfulness and the multiplication and them subduing everything, whatever it was that Adam and Eve uh, did, they were doing all of those things over God's creation, not their own. They didn't do anything. God did it all. So God allows us to be stewards of his possessions. God also knows our struggles with materialism. I started out saying that at the very beginning. We struggle and we get caught up in our money and the things that we possess. We want more and more and more. And we see somebody next door that gets a new boat. Man, we want a new boat. We see somebody that gets a new truck and we want a new truck or, or whatever it is. We want all of those things. One of the things we need to understand from the beginning, if you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, just understand that most of the Joneses, uh, they're up to here in their, their eyeballs with debt. That's the reason why they've got all those things sitting out there. Very rarely is, are any of them Debt free and, and buying whatever they want to do. That's that top 1% we keep hearing about that can do that. But God knows our struggles with materialism. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So is money the root of all evil? No. Not money. But the love of it is. Because when we begin to love money above God, then that has become God. And so we forget God in the midst of that. We begin to look at things and begin to go, oh, wow, look at what I've done. Look at the fortune that I've amassed. Look at the retirement that I'm going to enjoy. If you make it that far, by the way. God knows our struggles. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 18. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. So listen, if you're here, and I, I don't know if you are or not, but if you're here today and you're rich, 
You, you, by whatever means you want to call that rich. If you're here today and you're rich, the reason why you're rich is so that you can be a blessing to others. You have been blessed to be a blessing. I've heard that said many, many times over and over again. That's the reason that you are rich. How do I know that? I just read it. He says, charge those who are rich not to be haughty, not to be prideful. Not to be consumed with how good they are and great they are and how they've done all this stuff. What, how does that uh, verse 18 end? They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. So you have been blessed to be a blessing to others. It's when we forget that or when we ignore that that we get caught up in that idea of materialism. And then God desires for our giving to be an act of of worship. God desires for our giving to be an act of worship. 2 Corinthians 9 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So if it's an act of worship, how should we give? I'll give you three ways that we should give there uh, at the bottom of the outline. First, we should give willingly not because the pastor stands up and preaches a message on giving not because uh, there's pressure from the outside not because there's a survey that's been done that reveals that giving has not been where it should be inside the church it shouldn't be because you feel sorry for uh, whatever it is you know, the poor old preacher what you know whoever it is you should give willingly because God he is your Lord. He gave it all. And all He's doing is asking you to give back a little bit of what He has given you. Sometimes we mistake some things. And uh, I may have told you all this before. I'm not quite sure. But I had somebody, um, we were having a conversation about tithing and offerings. and They didn't quite understand why that was being done in the church. And they, they asked the question, they said, well, I just don't understand. Why do you all always pass the plate? Why are you always, and the way they looked at it is every week you pass the plate. So they're always asking for money. Why are you always asking for money? I mean, you don't pay any taxes. You, you get free power and free water and, and, and you get free this and free that. And, and I'm looking at them going, where's that at? Hey, what are you talking about? I said, there's nobody giving us free water or free electricity or free gas or whatever it is that we've got. No, we, we pay for all those things. Really? Well, what about you? I mean... It, you, you keep asking? I mean, the more they give, the more you get? I said, no, my, my salary's determined. It's going to be the same no matter what the people give in the year. I mean, that's just the way it is. I said, oh, really? I mean, to them, they just couldn't fathom why we give. Well, why do you give? And then I go down the line of what we did as a church to help the community. How we gave to help people who were in need of uh, gas and their, you know, fuel for their fuel tank or whatever it is. And, and had to go through all those things and say, yeah, we still got bills to pay. Absolutely. But the goal was ministry. The goal was to be a blessing to others. And so as you give to the church, to the work of the church, then we give out of that to others. We give to the community, to the nation, and to the world. So that they can hear the name of Jesus. So they can hear the gospel. So we should give willingly. We should also give cheerfully. I know that one's tough. Sometimes giving cheerfully is one of the, the toughest things. Especially when you're looking at your, uh, your bank account online. And you're going, whoo, whoo, I don't know about that, that tie I checked this week. Because I'm going to have to, what they say? Uh, borrow from Peter to pay Paul or rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, I'm going to have to do those things. How can I give in that moment? You give cheerfully in that moment when you understand that God is in control and that he'll take care of you. Now, are there times where maybe, you know, you're not able to give as much as other times? Yeah, I'm, look, if your children are starving to death, if you're starving to death, I understand. I understand. 
And I believe God does as well. He's not an evil God. But he's going to provide for you if you believe in him and trust in him. Place your faith in him. So we should give cheerfully. And we also should give sacrificially. For someone who's got, I'm not saying a lot of money, but plenty of money to deal with what they need to deal with, it may not be very much a sacrifice for you to give 10% or 5%, whatever it is. It may not be much of a sacrifice for you to give. But should we go above and beyond that? Should we push ourselves? Because if you're not giving sacrificially, are you really feeling the weight of that? Are, are you really um, going above and beyond for the Lord's work? Whatever it may be. When you give in this way, God blesses in ways that he otherwise won't. So sometimes we need to give sacrificially as well. So willingly, cheerfully, and sacrificially. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says this. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So ultimately, we reap what we sow. A pastor was asked by a man in his church once, should I give off of the gross or the net of my paycheck? The pastor very quickly responded, do you want God to bless some of it or all of it? The guy looked at him and went, uh, what? He said, I mean, it sounds to me like you're wondering, do I want to give off of everything or do I want to give off some of it? I'm just asking you, how do you want God to bless it? Do you want him to bless it all or just part of it? That's not a statement of how you should give. But when we begin to understand that God wants us to give willingly, cheerfully and sacrificially, we shouldn't be trying to come up with reasons why we shouldn't give in one way or another. Giving into the work of a kingdom ministry is a manner of our worship and an investment. First, into your personal relationship with Jesus. If you give the way he calls us to give, then you are worshiping him. As a matter of fact, we said that was it. The manner of our worship is generous giving. It's, it's being a giver. So... When we give, we invest into our personal relationship with Jesus. It means we're being obedient to him. We're also investing into the ministry to those in the church. For those who may be in the church and they're struggling and they need help. And we're able to give to them based off of giving. That's an investment into one another. Then into the community around the church. Anytime we try to give and be the hands and feet of Jesus, we're investing in this community. We want this community to be better because we're here. If our community doesn't benefit from us being here, then why are we here? Let's just be honest. If you can pluck up this church from this curve right here and remove it and nobody's life is changed or, or things uh, don't get worse or any better or whatever because we're gone, something's wrong. So we need to invest into the community and we need to invest into the world outside the local community around the world. That's why we keep praying for these missionaries, church planners, and all of those. And listen, as we close, understand this. When you consistently invest in your marriage, blessings happen. I've never done marital counseling with anyone whose marriage was struggling where they didn't stop investing sometime or another. One or the other or both. They stopped investing. They stopped spending time together. They stopped loving one another. They stopped doing things for one another. They stopped putting one another first. When you consistently invest in your job, blessings happen. When you do well at your job, you get promoted or you get a paycheck increase. Whatever it may be, blessings can happen through that. When you consistently invest in your church, blessings happen. The church begins to grow and flourish and we reach the community. When you consistently invest in your personal relationship with Christ, blessings happen happen when you're in God's word, when you're speaking to him on a regular basis, when you're trying to live a righteous life for him. 
But when it comes to giving and many other things, we've got to change our perspective. It is no longer about the law of giving as it is about the spirit of giving. It is no more about the law of loving Jesus. It's about the spirit of loving Jesus. See, when we start to change this mentality, we begin to see the fullness of what God meant. It's not just about the letter of the law. It's about the spirit of the law. Praise team, you can start coming forward. But as we close, I want to tell you the ultimate reason that we should be generous. It's because Jesus has been generous with us. He's been more than generous with us. He gave above and beyond. He gave willingly, cheerfully. He gave in every single way and He gave ultimately sacrificially. John 3.16, most of us know this verse. But maybe we need to be reminded sometimes. What does it say? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. He gave His own Son. If that's not a sacrificial giving moment, I don't know what He is. If God can give us sacrificially in that moment, we can also give sacrificially back to Him. And if you haven't done that, if you haven't given your heart back to Him first, because that's the only thing we really can offer Jesus, is we can offer our faith and our trust in Him. We can place our heart in His hands. If you haven't done that, you can do that today. All you have to do is repent of your sins and believe on Jesus. And the Scripture says that if you repent and believe, that you will be saved. And if you're here and you're struggling with this whole giving, whatever it is in your life, you are a follower of Jesus, but man, it's, it's just gotten harder and harder. Maybe today is the day where you start going back to Him. He said earlier in, in Malachi, He says, Return to me, and I will return to you. So for those of us in the room, if you found yourself backing away from Jesus, and He's getting softer and softer in His voice, maybe even you're not hearing Him right now. You need to return to Him. Because if you do, He says He'll return to us. We're going to have a song of invitation, Amazing Grace. We'll look for it in the hymn books. It'll be on the screen as well. Our praise team will leave us in that. If you need prayer for anything, if you want to join the church, if you want to uh, you know, find Jesus for the first time, you say, I want to respond to, to Jesus and give Him my life. Whatever it may be, you can find me down front or you can find me after the service. I'd be more than happy to pray with you, walk through Scripture with you. Uh, you can contact me anytime. So let's stand as Christian leaders.